The Soviet people called this river, the largest in Europe, Mother Volga. During the fighting for Stalingrad, the defenders of the city took an oath. There is no land for us beyond the Volga. Hello, I'm Bert Lancaster. Before the epic battle fought here, few Americans ever heard of the city of Stalingrad. But when the Nazis surrendered to the Soviet army on January 31st, 1943, in the largest military action in history, Stalingrad became a source of inspiration to the Allies in their mutual struggle against Hitler. In the course of the Battle of the Volga, the Soviet armed forces destroyed five armies of Germans and their fascist allies, one-fourth of all the Wehrmacht forces on the Eastern Front. This victory strengthened the morale of the anti-Hitler coalition at a crucial time in the war. Our story, victory at Stalingrad. it had become clear to the world that a decision at Stalingrad would have far-reaching consequences for both Russia and Germany. The Red Army soldiers under General Yeremenka had held their shrinking perimeter with extraordinary courage. On the other hand, the Nazis showed no signs of relaxing their pressure. The army command post in Stalingrad had been encircled by flames more than once. The Nazis were only 300 yards away. A German lieutenant wrote, Stalingrad is no longer a town. By day, it is an enormous cloud of burning, blinding smoke. It is a vast furnace lit by the reflection of the flame. In this inferno, the Soviet soldiers fought on, outnumbered. By the time November came, the Soviet troops in Stalingrad had been isolated for two months. It was a place that turned a novice into a veteran overnight. Beginning of the winter, 1942, von Paulus's sixth army at Stalingrad was stuck fast. It had gone well that summer for the Nazis. Less well in November. December to January was a time of reckoning. Defenders of Stalingrad had survived assault after massive assault by the Nazis. It was time for the counterstroke. 
As Supreme Commander, Stalin approved the plan. Conceived by Zhukov. And Vasilevsky. In conjunction with Marshal of Artillery, Vordanov. The Soviet High Command named it after the planet Uranus. General Vatutin was to command the Southwest Front. General Rokossovsky, the Don Front. General Yeremenka and his political advisor Nikita Khrushchev, the Stalingrad Front. Overall control were Zhukov and Vasilevsky. Zhukov had made his preparations without the Germans' knowledge. Ten armies, over a million soldiers, 1,500 tanks, 15,000 pieces of artillery from the Soviet reserves in Siberia, the Urals, and Kazakhstan. Everything had been concentrated without the Nazis' knowledge. The Nazi general Yodel said later, earlier there had been nothing there, but all of a sudden a heavy strike was delivered of decisive importance. operation on a scale not seen before in the unknown war. It was a simple concept, a coordinated drive against the Romanian armies on von Paulus's flanks to pin his sixth army against the Volga. of November 19th was damp and foggy over Stalingrad. At 6.30, the weary Soviets heard from their strong points in the rubble a distant thunder. Vatutin and Norkosovsky had opened their assault to the northwest. The Soviets crashed through the Romanians without pause forcing a breach 50 miles wide. Rokossovsky and Vatutin began to swing to the south. Day, November 20th, Yeremenka's armies lunged forward south of Stalingrad, overwhelming the Nazi defenses and created an opening 30 miles across. Within the ravaged city, the Soviet 62nd Army fought on. They could hear the guns drawing near, mile by mile. Yard by yard, they reclaimed the ruined buildings they had lost and won 
and lost again. The Unknown War will be back after this. Returns to Survival at Stalingrad. At four in the afternoon of November 23rd, four days after the start of the offensive, the Soviet armies met. Trapped inside the ring were 22 Nazi divisions, infantry and panzer. 300,000 men. There was no way out for General von Paulus. The Germans tried a massive airlift. It failed. The Soviets claimed a thousand Nazi planes shot down. On the day the ring closed around Stalingrad, von Manstein took over the attempt to relieve von Paulus's army. He scraped together whatever units were available and tried to stabilize a front that was falling apart. The plan was for a panzer army under General Hoff to drive to the Stalingrad perimeter. Paulus would break out to meet him. But Hoth's attack was enveloped short of Stalingrad. By December 21st, 1942, von Manstein's armor was marooned and the mass of his infantry, nearly a quarter of a million men, had been written off. Paulus made no attempt to break out of Stalingrad, though his army was the largest single concentration of the Wehrmacht in the east. A day after completing the encirclement, the Soviets trebled their firepower around Stalingrad. On January 8th, the Soviets made an offer of surrender, guaranteeing life and including permission to wear military honors. Paulus rejected the offer. At Christmas time, the Germans in Stalingrad had eaten their horses. They got one slice of bread a day. The daily issue of ammunition was 20 or 30 cartridges a man. The situation of the 6th Army was hopeless. Two days later, January 10th, the Red Army attacked from the west to link up with the 62nd Army, still fighting from its bunkers on the Volga Bank. It 
took them some days of intense fighting, of the kind the 62nd Army had been engaged in for months before they reached their comrades. Last, they came to the tractor plant. Some of the most savage battles of the entire war had been fought around it and inside it. German army. Until this, they had only known the taste of victory. The last phase of the Stalingrad battle had been as bitter as the rest. Two weeks of hand-to-hand -hand encounters among the fire-blackened stones. It started on the eve of the 10th anniversary of Hitler's regime. Pocket after pocket was surrendering. Daniel gave himself up to General Tobukin. Soviets put the figure of German dead since the encirclement at 200,000. The prisoners numbered 91,000. fewer than 24 generals were included, and one field marshal, von Paulus. On January 31st, von Paulus surrendered. Unknown War will continue in a moment. A&E now returns to Survival at Stalingrad. Indecisive, remote, moody, von Paulus was something of a tragic figure. He had been one of the authors of Plan Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. At Nuremberg, he testified against fascism and the regime he had served. But in the Inverin 
mountains of Stalingrad, where von Paulus had commanded, there had been a camp for Soviet prisoners of war. When the Red Army liberated it, the survivors said there had been 2,000 in the camp only a few weeks before. Now, only 20 were alive. The rest had died of starvation, sickness, torture. Arthur Schmidt, von Paulus's chief of staff, was the only one of von Paulus's officers to remain an unrepentant Nazi through his years in Soviet hands. In 1960, by then a prosperous designer in Hamburg, Schmidt still had no regrets. Germans, Romanians, Italians, Hungarians. The wreckage of a huge army, tens of thousands of them shambling through the snowdrifts. After the battle to celebrate survival. The end of the Stalingrad battle was also observed in Berlin. Like some gigantic firestorm, the battle had sucked into it whatever came near it. 800,000 men had died. Under the Russian counterstroke, the German armies in the south had only just escaped annihilation. Hitler's best hopes for victory over the Soviet Union had been extinguished. In 
Stalingrad itself, they began the long road of recovery. But first they congratulated themselves. The Nazis and their allies had lost five armies, a quarter of the enemy's strength on the Eastern Front. Stalingrad knew it was an inspiration to all who fought against Hitler. the world, the victory was recognized for what it was, a turning point in World War II. From now on, in the East, the Wehrmacht's posture must be fundamentally defensive. From now on, the Red Army held the initiative. The Unknown War will be back after this. Turns to Survival at Stalingrad. In the Kremlin, Ambassador Harriman presented Stalin with a commemorative scroll signed by President Roosevelt on behalf of the American people. It designated Stalingrad the turning point of the war. British armorers fashioned a sword of honor, the gift of King George VI to the people of Stalingrad. Churchill presented it to Stalin at the Tehran conference. It was given to representatives of Stalingrad by Marshal Bodoni. Comrades, the President of the Council of People's Commissars, the Supreme Commander-in-Chief of our Soviet Union, Comrade Stalin, has asked me to give you the Honor Sword, the gift of the British King George VI to the citizens of Stalingrad to honor the heroic defense of the city. London too they celebrated. Sir Anthony Eden, the foreign secretary. Never in all its long, proud history has the German army sustained such an unmitigated disaster as the Red Army has inflicted upon it in the Battle of Stalingrad. Hitler has been outgeneraled, outmaneuvered, and outfought. And we've had one other additional bit of good news lately, of which I hope you all took careful note. It was a feeling of deep relief that we all read that Hitler was to continue to control the German war machine. Defenders of Stalingrad, the victors of Stalingrad, rested briefly and then moved on, towards the front by now well over a hundred miles to the west. They were
would fight another battle, but none as hard as the one they had just finished. safe to leave their shelters now, safe for the civilians to take over the battlefield that had been their homes. There was not much left that was familiar. Tehran conference, Churchill suggested to Stalin that the city should be left just as it was, a terrible monument forever. But the Soviet people needed the city to live again, and live it did after years and years of labor, a gleaming testament on the banks of Mother Volga. children of war, many without homes, without families, all security stripped for them by the rake of battle, alone, silent, uncomprehending. Mortal danger everywhere. Mines, booby traps, live ammunition, unexploded bombs. They could not yet begin to clear the debris. They warned each other to give things time to recover. to Bekatovka, Klava. One of the most important services was the mail. Neighbors, families, friends had been scattered by the Nazi onslaught. Now the messages arrived and went, re-establishing the old ties. Familiar sounds came back, a voice on the telephone. Radio speakers booming into the streets.
battle of streetcars. And the clatter of children going to school. Or as much school as was left. The Unknown War will continue in a moment. Bible at Stalingrad. The Nazis would have no further use for this. The Soviets would have a use for it. Thousands had died here, on both sides, contesting it. Within months, it had returned to peaceful use. Re-equipped, the plant set out its first tractors to the newly liberated areas. A generation later, the tractors are still rolling out of Stalingrad. From all over the Soviet Union, aid and comfort poured into Stalingrad. It was as if everyone in Russia felt themselves a citizen of that proud city. of young communists came in to help in reconstruction, living in makeshift accommodations. back into people's lives. They set about the task with all their energy. And the city began to grow. Five years after the Battle of Stalingrad, the Soviet people unveiled their monuments to it. Leonid Brezhnev. General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union said this. Twenty-five years ago, our people, our Soviet system, won a great victory here on the Volga banks. Here, our Soviet motherland had to stand the most severe trial of its history. 
здесь, на Мамаевом кургане, где, как говорят, к концу боев... Here on the Mamayev hill, where they say by the end of the battle there was more metal than earth. All of us think now of the staunchness of our people, of all the things they had to endure without wavering, without any doubt in imminent victory. The victory at Stalingrad was not only a victory, but a history-making feat of arms. people love flowers and treasure them. Flowers are precious to the Russians. Remembering their dead, they are prodigal with them. On the monuments of Stalingrad, cut forever in stone, there are, some say, a million names. Each is the name of one brave man or one innocent child who left others to grieve. The winds of war are echoes no more Yet they still resound It seems to me that peace is the reason Worlds were meant to go round And the world goes round Around and around It never stops its turn I sometimes wonder What we have found through the years. Hello, goodbye, the earth and the sky is all we've ever known, and life is part of giving Never 
seas But still we salute the greatest tank battle. In the summer of 1943, the tanks of the Red Army and Hitler's Panzers met head-on in a brutal slugging match at Kursk. The battle involved over 6,000 tanks. It lasted for a week. It was one of the most ferocious in the unknown war. Tomorrow, thundering herds of wildebeest brave the dangerous Serengeti for their annual migration on Kingdom of the Sun. Now stay tuned for Cities at War, next on a and &E.